we've been going through Philippians in microscopic detail. And that can be very useful. But it can also be very challenging. Because you've got to try and keep the context of what all's been going on in the grand sweep of the book. We can dig into the details of what this word means or how this sentence is written or the thrust of this within its culture. But in the process, as we're trying to get caught up on those details, we lose track of the fact that this is a book or a letter that Paul intended to be read. Just stand up. Paul and Timothy bond servants of Christ Jesus, to the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the elders and the deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in my every remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For of this very thing I am confident that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. It's only right for me to feel this way. Since both in my imprisonment and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. I mean, this, Paul would have that letter read to the church and the odds are they would read it a second time. It's not a once read through letter. It would be read to everybody twice, and that's important because there are some things that Paul thinks of later on that help infuse meaning earlier in the letter. Some scholars get wrapped up in that and say, well, you can't take the end and put it to the beginning because the hearers wouldn't have thought about that. And those scholars don't realize that these letters aren't read at once. These letters are read twice, three times at the same sitting so that people can absorb it better. And that's the way of the oral traditions and the oral cultures. So within the framework of this, I'm worried that today's class doesn't make sense if we don't put a little bit of review in. It's also rather handy since this is Labor Day weekend. Uh, happy Labor Day, by the way. I'm sure all of you mothers who labored over your children. Wait, that's a different kind of labor. <laughs> happy Labor Day, whatever that may mean to you. But within the framework of that, the, the, we've got people here who are visiting. I met David from Tulsa, Oklahoma this morning. I've met other people. We've got uh, a phenomenal a symphony director, I think, here, or no, a flute player. I, I'm always getting those two things confused. And uh, we, 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 a flautist. We've got uh, uh, amazing people visiting that I'm sure I haven't had a chance to meet, but a little review never hurts anybody on a holiday weekend. So let's just sit down and make sure that we're all on the same page gathering the context here. We're looking today at Philippians 2, 12 through 18. That's chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. But if we're looking at that, those ideas that he's got bounces off some previous passages. And so we need to go back, and I want to go back to the very beginning of this section of the book. And that was Philippians 1, verse 27. So here's the way the passage reads. Philippians 1.27 Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. This passage that begins only let your manner of life be worthy of of the gospel of Christ is the thesis sentence for the whole section that we've been dealing with that we conclude today. If we were writing an English paper, this is our theme statement for this section. This is Paul's theme for Philippians 1.27 through 2.18, which is where we're concluding. 
It's all wrapped up in an explanation of what it means to let your life, your manner of life, be worthy of the gospel of Christ. That sentence itself is a bit unusual. <clears throat> when we talk about something being worthy, especially if we know that the gospel of Christ is, is a buzzword for Paul, a buzz phrase. It's a buzzword and a buzz phrase. It references the fact that Jesus Christ took on the responsibility for our sin. He died the death that that sin should have produced in us so that as he was resurrected, we share in the resurrection. The good news is that none of us have to stand accountable to God based upon our performance. All of us stand accountable to God based upon the performance of Christ. And that's the gospel. But Paul is saying that the gospel is not simply something that makes you stand right before God. The gospel is also something that has moral and ethical implications. I've got five children. I got a boatload of grandchildren. That's a good thing. And and they're related to me. They share my DNA. My five kids got my name. Oh, my daughters may have tried to marry it off. But it's still there latent somewhere. And as they wear my name, they've got that. But oh, I hope that they will live in a way that brings honor to the name. I told my girls when they were young and out there in the dating world, I told them, number one, don't ever trust a boy. Number two, sorry, I didn't quite say it that way. Number two, remember whose child you are. Remember that, that you are out there with my name. I have people who work uh, for me. And the name of my law firm is the Lanier Law Firm. The name of, of, my, uh, of our library is the Lanier Library. And I tell people, you know, whether you like it or not, when you say you work for Lanier, you reflect something of me. And I expect you to do it in a way that, 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 that helps. Not that makes people say, gee, what an idiot Lanier must be to have those people represent him. Or Lanier must be an absolute jerk because he's got a bunch of jerks that work for him. See, in that sense, Paul's using this phrase that we are to let our manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. We are to live in a way that, that measures and, and shows in positive ways the, the value and the reality of the truth that Christ died for us. And that's his theme here. And that's this idea between worthy, worthy, axios in the Greek. Axios means in a manner that's suitable, that's worthy. And I told you when we covered this in more detail that this was the prism through which Paul saw all of life. Paul understands everything we do through the prism of of the death of Christ. Now, I want to get on a soapbox for a moment. My soapbox comes from this. 
there are some marvelous, marvelous Christian people who have the best intentions, who are driven by a heart really seeking to serve the Lord, and who have dedicated their lives to that. And I have great honor and I have great respect for them and I thank them. But sometimes they take things out of balance. I watched a semi-famous speech by one such person that I dare say I would regard as a friend. Not a close friend, but a friend. And the speech was 20 some odd years ago. It was profoundly motivating. Motivating to a generation as he called them to give their lives up in service to Christ. Which is a laudable thing to do. But in the midst of giving our lives up in service of Christ, we need to understand that Paul taught that all of life is seen through this prism. And that the only things of value are things done for Christ, but things done for Christ are not only going out and evangelizing. They're not only selling everything you've got and giving it to the poor. They're not only fill in the blank with a super spiritual thing. Sometimes doing right by Christ and serving Christ is washing the dishes at home out of love. Sometimes it's changing the dirty diaper. Sometimes it's actually watching a college football game so that your brain can defry. So that you can understand some of the culture in which you live. I got Coach Max Bowman over here. Coach Max Bowman, you in the men's group know, everybody probably knows. He comes up here all the time to announce one thing or another he's got going for men. But he's a fellow who not only played football, he coached it on a high school level, he coached it on a college level. Heavens, he coached in the Super Bowl with the Buffalo Bills. And, and now he works as, as a big wig within Fellowship of Christian Athletes, FCA. And he'll be the first to tell you, as Billy Graham said, a football coach talks to more people and influences more people in a year than most people do in a lifetime. And so to say, well, there's no business being uh, paying attention to athletics. We've got to be super spiritual. You need to be watching Mark Lanier's video thoughts for the day instead. Heavens, you can watch them both. There's ethical content to the gospel. Paul sees all of life through the prism of the gospel. And he does not do that by reducing life down to these spiritual chores. He does it recognizing there's a full gamut of this life. God gave you things to enjoy. And it's okay to enjoy them in the right balance. You never say, I'm living for me. But if God gives you a wonderful meal, if God has given you a job you like, don't feel guilty over it. Rejoice and praise the Lord over it and thank him for it. And seek ways to use it to further his kingdom. Soapbox off. So Paul says, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. And he's used this word. Polituomai is right here. Polit. Don't say, well, what does that mean? Well, not polite, but you get more of it if you look at the polit. Politics. Means to be a citizen, to have a home. Here it's in the middle form. The middle form means it's, it's kind of reflected to yourself. So it means to conduct your life like a citizen. So what Paul is saying is, 
conduct your life like a citizen of the gospel, of the kingdom that was produced by Christ. The, the, the Philippi, you'll recall, was an actual Roman outpost in the sense that Rome gave citizenship rights there. A lot of the Roman Empire had their own law. But in Philippi, they had Roman law, they had Roman rule, they had Roman citizen rights. That means that you could live in Philippi and vote for who's in politics in Rome. You got to absentee vote. Just saying. So what Paul is really saying here is, Monon, just one thing. Live like a citizen in a manner that's suitable for citizenship in the gospel of Christ. Think of your life not as part of a Roman colony, not as part of the United States of America, not as part as Texas, not as a Houstonian, not as a Tulsonian. Think of your life as a member of the kingdom of God colony. And then live in a way that's appropriate for that. Citizenship has rights and responsibilities. Live appropriately. So this only live your manner life worthy, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ is the theme that's now wrapping up today. And so we're going to wrap it up making three points. The first, I want to talk to you about Paul's affection. The second thing I want to do is talk to you about a, a difficult passage. And then the third thing is a final conclusion. So let's start with Paul's affection. We're now in Philippians 2.12. We've still got the same principle, the same theme. Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Live like a citizen of the gospel. And Paul says here, therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. And he starts going on. This hosty starts out, it's translated the therefore here, hosty. Hosty is a hinge word. That's what I call it, David. I'm sure that's not like the right Greek. I'm not sure that a Greek grammarian would use that word, but in my brain, as a visual fella, I think of hosty as a hinge word. Here's what I mean. Because of what I've said so far, I want you to hear this. Because of what I've said, now hear this. So you can translate it, therefore, you can translate it, so then. You know, so then... And, and that's what it's here. And so this is a word, when I see this word, I get real excited. He's about to make a point. And do you know what Paul does? He goes all ADD on us. He gets distracted. He doesn't get to his other side of the hinge for some time. Now, what is it that's so important that makes Paul stop his therefore? His so then. Why does he stop the dominoes that we expect to fall? Look at what he inserts. Therefore, agape toi mu, my beloved. And when Paul thinks about how special those people are to him, he loses track of what he was going to say, and he starts talking about them. Um, I tried to think of an illustration, and two come to mind. First, Earlier in the lesson, when I was talking about how we need to see all of life through the prism of the gospel, I got distracted and I got on a soapbox. 
I pulled a Paul. I got back to my point, but I just had to interject something for a minute because it just seemed ripe. Second, when I was getting ready for this class, I hit a point where I thought, eh, I'm not quite as motivated as I need to be. It's going to be Labor Day weekend. We're going to have tight attendance. Actually, attendance is pretty good for what we've had. Thank you for being here, by the way. And I'm just kind of like, eh, I got a lot that's going on. I got a lot. Eh. And you know what happened? I started picturing you people. A lot of you, I know your names. A lot of you, I don't. But I know your faces. I can tell you where you sit. <laughs> I miss JC not being here today. He passed away last Sunday. God bless Karen and the family. JC's dancing with the Lord right now, telling him all about glycoscience. I know where you are. I know where Louise would be if he were here today. And I started thinking about that. I thought, man, I love those people. Those people are going to give me 45, 50 minutes of their Sunday morning. How dare I not give them the best I can. And so with prayer before God, God, Use me Sunday morning to speak into their lives. Give me motivation. Give me desire. Give me study. Let's do what we can do because these people, I love these people. And that motivation made me see this passage that experience, I should say, made me see this passage and I thought, yeah, that's exactly what happens to Paul. Paul's writing, so he's, I mean, he's just done this incredible song and he's got a therefore that's going to bring down the house and before he gets to the therefore, he says, therefore, my beloved, oh, oh, I love these people. You know, I don't want to get too down on them. I want them to know and he starts, he starts expounding on this. My beloved, you know, um, uh, just as uh, uh, in all things you obey. You've always done this. You've always obeyed. And, and he's talking about, he's bragging on them. We get all hung up on this because of the word obey. Um, ooh, Paul is into obedience. Well, <laughs> Just hold on. Let's look at this word. This is hupakuo in the, the Greek. It's a compound word. Hoop means under. Like, have you ever been hypnotized? <laughs> See, the, that Greek U is often transliterated as an English Y. So we get hip, hypnotized, hypnotized when you go under. Okay? Hoop is under. Akuo is a good word for musicians, flautist. Acoustics comes from it. It's to hear. Akuo means I hear. It's one of the principal verbs you learn in first semester Greek. Akuo, akueis, akue. Akuo men, akuete, akusi. Something like that. I may have it wrong. But I don't think I do. Um, aku, hoop akuo means if you broke it apart, and that's not always fair to do with a compound word, but it's been built as this idea of to hear and to come under, or to follow, or to respond to. It's the idea of coming under something of, 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 uh, based on something you've, you're hearing. It's listening and then heeding something. Um, let me give you a place where you'd never dream the word obey is used. Acts chapter 12, verse 13. Peter's been in prison. By the grace of God, he's been released. All right, let's see. Here we are. 
And let's get bigger and bigger. So Peter realizes this. He goes to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the doorway, the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. By the way, Rhoda is the patron saint of ditzy people. <laughs> if you read the whole story, she says, who's there? It's Peter. Let me in before they arrest me again. I've escaped prison. Whoa, it's Peter. And she leaves the door locked with him standing outside on the street while she runs back and tells everybody, Peter's here. They've let him out of prison. We've got to let him. Oh, oh whoops. And she go let him in and then come tell us. But anyway, this passage right here. When he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. That's got this verb, hupakuo, obey, in it. Do you know where it is? She obeyed the knock of the door. She answered. She heard and responded. That's the idea behind this word. To hear and to respond. By the way, here's the patron saint part. Recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she didn't open the gate, but ran in and reported Peter was standing at the gate. They said, you're out of your mind. <laughs> I think they meant it for another reason. Um, <laughs> God bless Rhoda. Let me give you another illustration of this word. Romans 6, 16. Here we see Paul using it in a way that gives us some more insight into the range of the, the meaning of the word. Okay, what then? Are we to sin because we're not under law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you're slaves of the one whom you obey, either of the sin which leads to death or of obedience which leads to righteousness. Now, you've got hupakuo throughout this. But it's always got this same idea of you're a slave to the one you listen to and, and answer. Listen to and answer. And that's what Paul's getting at here in this passage. Paul loves those people. But for Paul, love is expressed in action. I could tell you, I love you. I appreciate you. I love you. I love you showing up. I love the encouragement it gives me. And I love you so much, I'm not going to prepare for class. I'm just going to go soak it up. But that's not love. Love is service in action. Love says, you, you, if, if you've got love and affection for me, when you come here on a Sunday morning, you show me that love and affection. When you tune in on the internet, you show me that love and affection. And, and it, it's, 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 it's real, but it's express. You know, I can tell my wife all day long, Becky, I love you. Would you get me a Diet Coke? Becky, I love you. Would you rub, it's cricking my neck. Would you rub my back? There's a difference between saying something and showing something. And Paul has love expressed in action. But I'll go a step further. Paul says that faith is expressed in action as well. The fact that we believe and we trust leads to hearing and responding. But this whole idea of obeying that Paul's talking about is living in a manner appropriate for citizens of the kingdom. It is living in a manner 
appropriate and worthy of the gospel of Christ. Jesus did not, it, Scripture does not say, for God so loved the world that he told him, I love you. No, it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus so loved the world that he came. And it, love is expressed in action, but so is faith. So look, for example, at Romans 1, 5, and then we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians 1, 3, and then we've got to move on. Romans 1, 5. Paul, at the very beginning of this letter to the Romans, talks about um, that uh, Jesus was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we've received grace and apostleship to bring about hupakuo of faith for the sake of his name, his reputation among the nations. Paul says, we have received the grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience, hearing and responding, answering the knock at the door, heeding what we hear, doing what we've been asked to do. And that is something that is an obedience of faith. It is a, a, a genitive that to me is like almost every kind of genitive there is. Genitive objective, subjective, of origination. I mean, you, you can go through the list. It's all of that. In other words, our obedience comes from our faith, but it also is an obedience of our faith, to our faith. It's also an obedience that is origined by faith. It's, it's an obedience that, that is labeled of faith. It's the way we can label our faith. It's, it's, it is part of the Christian calling. If you believe, if you really trust that Jesus Christ gave his life for you, and that you are a citizen in his kingdom, and you're going to live your life worthy of that, or in a manner where you're trying to, then you're going to respond in positive ways, trying to hear and come under, if that makes any sense. This same principle is in 1 Thessalonians 1, 3, though the language is slightly different. 1 and 2 Thessalonians 1, 3. Here Paul says, We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, your steadfastness of hope. We work because of our faith. We labor because of our love. We are steadfast. We persevere. We keep going because of our confident expectation, our hope. And that's the way of the Christian walk. So Paul says... To let your life be, manner of life, be worthy of the gospel of God. And then he starts his affection for the people and he talks about, oh, I love you. And, and man, you love me. I see it in the way you serve me and the way I serve you. And, and he gets sidetracked. But then after he gets sidetracked, he gets to the other part of his hostie, of his so then or therefore. So let's put it back up here. Therefore, my beloved... As you've always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, this causes a bunch of trouble in the history of Christian interpretation. You want to see the Catholics and the Protestants fight historically? Sometimes it's been over this precise verse. You want to see the legalists fight with the grace people? This is one of the verses. And, and it's interesting, in the Greek, it doesn't come first. The Greek actually says, with fear and trembling, 
and then it gets to uh, uh, you or your salvation, you need to work it out. Your own. Work it out. If we're going to understand that, is Paul saying that we have to work to get our salvation? That seems to fly in the face of everything Paul's ever said. But here's where it's so important that we talk about context. And this is one of the reasons why I had to put the review into this lesson. I had a witness one time. Uh, Dr. David Eagleman was on the stand. I was trying this case in St. Louis, Missouri. And Dr. Eagleman was getting cross-examined by the other lawyer. And the other lawyer said, Dr. Eagleman, didn't you say A, B, C? And Dr. Eagleman said, I said ABC, but that's not all I said. But you said ABC, didn't you? Dr. Eagleman said, I said ABC, but that wasn't all I said. But it is what you said, ABC. Finally, Dr. Eagleman looked at him and said, you know, to quote it as if that's all I said is akin to saying, It was a beautiful day, and then the tornado hit. (laughs) You have left out, and then the tornado hit. And so you leave a false impression if you only want to say, didn't you say it was a beautiful day? Well, that's part of what I said. I said it was a beautiful day, and then the tornado hit. Context is extremely important. So within the context of this, work out your own salvation. Let's first understand these words. That word work out. Um, so it's a compound of a bunch of stuff. Ergodzomai is ergo is to work. Ergos is, to, is a work. Or uh, ergodzomai is, is I work. And kater means ultimately down. But, but you put it together. It's this idea of carrying out producing, accomplishing, being successful in the face of obstacles. Paul's saying, with your own salvation, you need to to carry it out. You need to go through it. You need to, to walk in it. You need to work it out. In the sense, maybe, of, of working out yeast to go through bread as you need it. You, know, you work it out. Process this thing. You process your salvation. And he says, you know, and, and, and this idea, I, I don't have time, make the notation, go to Romans 7, 18, and you'll, you can look and see how Paul's, well, let's just make time. Romans 7, 18, people aren't going to necessarily have a chance to do this. Romans 7, 18. Paul uses the same word here. Um, I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh, in that old, fallen, unregenerate part of me. I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. I can't work it out. I don't have that ability to carry it out at times. That's, That's his frustration he's expressing there. You know, I know what's right to do. But I'm not always able to do it. Paul is using the same word here, I think, in the same sense. That, you know, work it out. Try to carry it out. Try to accomplish this salvation of yours. Now, this is not a text that's telling people how to get saved before God. This is a text in the context telling people how to be ethical on why it's important to be ethical. Telling people and being responsible to tell them, be ethical. It makes a difference how you behave. And if you take it in the context of the problem that Paul's addressing in Philippi, which is they were just fussing with each other, here's my paraphrase of this passage. 
Stop your fussing and get about God's work. And that's in effect what Paul's saying. Stop your fussing and get about God's work. Look at this passage. He says, he actually starts it out with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation. Fear and trembling is something that is used over and over in the Old Testament. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, you'll see these words used. I pulled two good illustrations. Deuteronomy 2.25. Deuteronomy 2.25 gives you an idea. This day, I will begin to put the dread and fear of you on the peoples who are under the whole heaven, who will hear the report of you and tremble and be anguished, in anguish because of you. They will have fear and trembling in the Greek. The Greek is... is, is these same words, phobu, uh, the, the word for phobos for, for fear is, we get phobia from it. And uh, we get tremors from the word for trembling. So, so it's fear and trembling. And Paul uses words that in the Old Testament are typically, not always, but typically used to talk about the awe that people will have in the world at the work of the mighty hand of God. And, and so we should have awe at the mighty work of the mighty hand of God. And that's what we need to do. We need to be in awe of God and what he can do. And in that way, we process and we live accordingly. We need to know that God's working in us. It's God who works in you. So you can be. Successful in working out, in living ethically, because God empowers you. This is, doesn't it even look like energy? In ergo, we get the word energy from it. God empowers you. God is, and, and, and the form here is a present active participle. That means right now God's doing this. God's empowering you. God's giving you the ability. Do not ever say, well, that's, I just can't, I just, this is just me. You know, few people as dear in my life as my grandmother, Catherine, Nina. She passed away, what, 10 years ago, Mom? Maybe longer? I don't know. My mom's mom. And I got to tell you, the last four or five years of her life, she good-naturedly, by and large, could say anything she wanted to. <laughs> she hit 90, and she just declared from here on out, it's free. <laughs> she said, well, I, I can say anything I want to. I'm 90. I say, well, grandmother, that's not very, doesn't matter. I'm 90. Well, she, well yeah, but you can't, I'm 90. Like that's a get out of jail free card. No, not even being 90 is a get out of jail free card. God is empowering us to live ethically, to work out, to, to carry out what we are as saved people. And I love that about this because I need that in my life. Now, this is interesting also, and I'm messing up if I don't point out, normally... In the Greek, as you read this sentence, and this is the start of this new sentence, it's translated here, um, God is uh, uh, working in you, but the Greek should have the for God in that order, and, it, and Paul switched the order of what you'd expect to see, and the reason he does that is to emphasize the word God. So he wants you to say, you can carry out what it, what, what it is to be saved. You can live that because God is working in you. God is empowering you. And he's clapping his hands on that God because he wants you to... He wants, that's God. Don't live your life thinking it's up to you. God's going to empower you to do this. 
Don't think, well, I'd be too embarrassed to talk about. God will embar- will empower you to get through the embarrassment. Don't think, well, I can't. God will empower you. You will always have the resources to do what is right because God has those resources and he's empowering you. And I love this because God who's empowering in you is looking to will. That's his uh, fellow is is his will and, and to work for his good pleasure. Like a parent. God delights in our best. So he will empower us to do our best. And he will take joy in that. So that's the difficult passage. I don't want to leave without the final conclusion. We'll have to make it rather quick because of time. Um, Do all things without grumbling or disputing. I love this. I love this because of this word, gongunzo. Don't gongunzo. Just don't do it. Just don't gongunzo. Do you know what gongunzo means? It's not used much in the Bible. It's used one other time, I think, in the New Testament. It's used in a number of places in the Old Testament, the Greek of the Old Testament, Paul's Greek Bible. Gongunzo means to murmur in a low voice. Yeah, right. Gong good so gong 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 Greek is good with that. Barbarians come from the fact they couldn't understand them. They thought barbarian in the Greek is barbara. Bar 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 bar. That's what they thought they were saying. Bar 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 bunch of bar barbarians. This is the same type word. Gong 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 gong. Don't do that. Don't grumble. Look, you want to see this passage in the Old Testament? It's Exodus 16, 7 and 8 and 9 and 12 and I mean on and on and on and on. But it's, it's I mean, here, I'll show you what gong, 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 gong is. Um, Exodus 16, 7. In the morning, you'll see the glory of the Lord because he's heard your for what is it that you against God? He's heard your your is not against us, but against the Lord. So come on, God's heard you. Just stop it, Paul says. And quit fussing with each other. That's the Dialogos, the, the quit, quit, uh, quit fighting, disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine like lights in the world. And he grabs that from the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, that there is a time coming when the wicked will be wicked, but the righteous people will shine like lights in the sky. Anybody can and be fussy. Don't do it. Because Paul always lived his entire life with a view of eternity. And Paul's confidence in eternity infused meaning into his present. Did you know I am closer to being dead today than I was yesterday? Every day. I have never in my entire life been this old. (laughs) The other side of that coin is I'll never be this young again. Paul had that view of eternity and it infused meaning into his presence. So he ends this passage and we end it holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I didn't run in vain. Paul, the athlete, race word, run in vain. That's, uh, <laughs> that's treco. <laughs> you just doesn't look like it because of the aorist form. Um, run in vain or labor 
Could mean, uh, could be carrying the, tr the training analogy, work out, train, in vain. Could also just mean work, in vain. Even if I'm to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I'm glad and I rejoice with you all and you should be glad and rejoice with me. There it is. Points to ponder. Let's conduct our life like a citizen in God's kingdom. Let's let the manner of our life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Point two, God delights in our best. So let's give him our best. God works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So let's work out what he's working in. And finally, I want to shine, not gong, 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 I want to shine like a light in the world for him, for his glory. Let me bless you and let's go to church. Father, in the name of Jesus, we call your blessing upon your people. We confess that we often are grumbling, even if we're doing it in our hearts. We confess that we're often not satisfied with our lot in life. We confess that we're often not satisfied with the direction things are going. We confess that we're not satisfied, not satisfied, not satisfied. And we gong, 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 grumble to you and to others. And we want to stop in the name of Jesus. And we want to grow and we want to shine like a light. We want people not to hear us discontent, but hear us walking in praise to your glory. In Jesus, amen. <laughs>